title name. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. Okay. so it's uh, digital learning. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Emil. Um, so yeah, as you mentioned, I'll be talking about differentiable programming as a useful framework for deep learning and machine intelligence. So just very quickly, a little about the background. Um, I'm an investor with Amplify Partners. We're an early stage venture firm that invests in technical founders. Uh, so our portfolio centers on compute infrastructure and applied AI. So namely, some examples are Fiverr, which does uh, you know, text summarization from diverse modalities. Determine AI, which employs deep learning on-prem, or deploys deep learning on-prem, and embodied intelligence, um, which applies deep reinforcement learning to robotics. And uh, my background before that was I did a PhD at Berkeley in statistics and So to start the story, uh, I wanted to take what seems at first blush a detour. And this is a really strange shape. It's called the Gombok, and it shows uh, it solves a very peculiar and delicate optimization. Um, so it's best kind of to understand the optimization by considering these balancing dolls that we might be familiar with. Um, they have a stable point of balance where, when push, will return to that um, point of balance on the bottom. So uh, what happens in these dolls at least is that the weight, they, they have an extra weight near the bottom, so it's incredibly stable. Uh, if a mathematician were to look at this, um, they might think about this property and ask, well, does this hold for a shape uh, that is you know, homogeneously, uh, homogeneous in how its weight is distributed? And if you kind of think about the first couple of shapes that maybe come up, pop up in your mind, you're looking at, say, a sphere, well, that doesn't work. You have like infinite number of uh, uh, unstable equilibria. And uh, you, in the case of a square, or a cube rather, you have six faces. So that also doesn't work. So the solution is um, satisfyingly beautiful. It's not unique, but this is one of the uh, optimizers of that constraint. It has one single point of stable equilibria at the bottom. So however you push this object, it will return to um, that stable point on the bottom. So what is interesting about this uh, in terms of this talk is that it took modern computational um, optimization to find the solution. In particular, its ability to rapidly test hypotheses, iterate um, on ideas, and get feedback. So um, such optimization programs help us explore complex, non-intuitive solution spaces and arrive at better optimizations than just analytically studying and I would argue that the power of differentiable programming is similar. So then to get started, what is differentiable programming? Well, bombastic thing that, uh, bombastic got in a bad way, but Jan LeCun recently kind of wrote, you know, deep learning will be differentiable programming. So uh, it's, he claims it's a more apt term to describe the advancements enabled by deep learning rather than what we sort of think about, okay, neural networks with a bit more layers than two. So in particular, the quote um, you know, explains in more detail. It says, people are now building a new kind uh, of software by assembling networks of parameterized functional blocks and by training them from examples using some form of gradient-based optimization. An increasingly large number of people are defining the networks procedurally in a data-dependent de way, allowing them to change dynamically as a function of the input data fed to them. It's really very much like a regular program, except it's parameterized, automatically differentiated, and trainable and optimizable. So just to kind of keeping more of a business mind, mindset about it, uh, to start, let's establish that differentiable programming is not just machine learning. It's more, uh, it's not just another tool in the box. Rather, it's a conceptual apparatus for how to apply these tools. So results if you're sort of coming new to the field, the results might seem diverse and unrelated. You know, so from AlphaGo to robotics, drug discovery, and enterprise infrastructure. Um, my goal for this talk is to make the progress and future directions seem comprehensible under, um, rather than just a bag of great results. So 
The goal then is to explain why differentiable programming is a better framework to understand applications in machine learning and how we can use this understanding to better anticipate where applications will arise uh, and thus direct our attention to the infrastructure that needs to be built uh, to achieve this. And just kind of a side note, there, Chris Ola has a really good blog post from sev several years ago that kind of casts uh, uh, how neural networks and types and functional programming is related, so you should check that out if you're kind of interested in delving deeper. But just as a more kind of like larger picture approach, um, to study how um, understanding differentiable programming framework translates to applications, I want to highlight three key areas that are particularly amenable to um, the differentiable programming approach. So um, you can really view these as three principles that helps us understand the commonality between instances of deep learning applications. So the first is uh, feature engineering is done by optimization, not you. Second, it's very simple for end to end approaches. And then lastly, it has incredible potential as a generative method. So to start off, uh, feature engineering is done by optimization, not you. That is the dream of you know, differentiable programming, and I guess much of machine learning in general. So I guess what I like to cast it, um, or how I understand it, is sort of how do we get to be really dumb by being a little bit smarter? And I'll break that down. But the key here is that you want to have architectures um, that are expressive enough to create good representations of different types of inputs. And uh, ideally, then, if you cast it as a learning problem, the algorithm design is, is learned. Uh, so what are some examples? Neural network architecture search. Um, so in this case, we use sequence sequence models to uh, design from scratch a neural network um, that can, you know, in, in their paper, they apply to image data and also language data. Uh, it trains many models in parallel and uses accuracy of the convergent uh, model to, um, as a signal for the design choices. And uh, because there's like mo motifs of filters and how, uh, how large uh, these filters have to be, et cetera, you can really cast it as a, as a well, in this case, use a recurrent neural network as the control. So the result is that architectures created from scratch outperform most human-invented architectures. And in some sense, it's like not surprising if you're really looking at the practice and the deep learning and the nitty-gritty. You're, you're a, lot, a lot of times, just iterating fast and pure to, to test whether certain architectural choices work. And so it's, it's rather empirical and engineering-based in that sense. And so why not do a step above, create um, that as a meta problem to learn? Um, another example is, you know, one of the more attention-grabbing results coming out of NIPS this past December, the case for learned index structures. Um, best summarized is the key idea, I guess, is the results um, in classical data structures uh, are provably optimal for general distributions or, you know, worst-case scenarios, et cetera, but um, may not be optimal if one has more information about the distribution. So instead, we can learn a model uh, or have a model learn the sort order or structure of lookup keys um, and use the signal to effectively predict the position or existence of records. So um, they were able to do this for a specific um, data structure and, and showed 70% 70, 70 uh, speed up. There is you know, maybe some criticism about like, hey, did we properly um, compare training time against the actual runtime? But I think what's really important about this example for me is that, you know, the We've led to, we're sort of exploring how differentiable programming could fundamentally, fundamentally change even the basic building blocks of computer science. So it just wheats your appetite for looking for more opportunities to apply this paradigm. So yeah, I think that's, that's the main excitement about this. Um, even in mathematics, so you know, Christian just gave a really great talk about how we can apply this to reasoning. This is a bit more of an algorithmic take on it, so I'm not actually doing formal uh, theorem proving in this case, but uh, in my own research, uh, why I'm sort of attracted to employing deep learning models is because um, in, in this instance, you have algorithms that do clustering on graphs, and in order to get at these algorithms, uh, the, the cases of graphs that we're looking at is extremely, uh, extremely kind of a difficult um, in an extremely difficult regime. They were very sparse with certain constraints. Um, so the kind of algorithms that were developed it required a heavy kind of uh, 
feature engineering by way of relating it to analogies in theoretical physics and grounding it in that formalism. And so what was really interesting is like, you kn we noticed, my co-author John Brunner and I noticed that there was a commonality in these algorithms and that they were spectral in nature and you would do some iteration of a uh, to, you know, getting the eigenvalue of the Laplace shift. And so all of that is to say is that after that realization, um, neural, you, you realize that you could design architectures that can be expressive enough to approximate this, and therefore you can cast it again as a learning problem. So it not only does it apply to the previous set of um, graphs that the original theorem was applied to, but you can actually uh, use this on, on a much broader array of data. Um, so another example. So, on to the second uh, point uh, is, um, so end-to-end -end approaches, uh, or it's very suitable for end-to-end -end approaches. So, end-to-end -end approaches are conceptually and mathematically elegant. So, the system is trained in a holistic manner, and uh, it's based on a single principle. So, every step is directed at the final goal, and there is no need to train an auxiliary objective. And so one reason to prefer this is that it might be that auxiliary objectives create a need for representations uh, that are richer than you would need them to be. Um, so if the system is learning in an end-to-end -end way, we might be optimizing more efficiently for the entire pipeline. So what are some good examples here? Uh, one thing that popped up um, in the literature, I think about two years ago, is uh, sort of multi or contextual bandits as a service, and in I guess extension, just reinforcement learning as a service. So in this case, we're serving, trying to decide to serve on uh, what page the paper uh, by which uh, people are going to decide. Uh, the task is following this. Okay, you have a very clear signal for engagement clicks. Um, so the that signal is is very well aligned for uh, what you would uh, want to optimize on, which is engagement. And then you can cast it as a uh, problem where you can iterate fast on different versions of the web page and then eventually uh, pick one. So think Spess Elastry with that diagram at the bottom, where you have explore, log, learn, and deploy. Um, so it's a good example of uh, an end-to-end model based on what you would like to optimize for in terms of website engagement. Uh, in this particular model, they had a 70% lift uh, above classical A-B testing. I think what's interesting is, you know, every, not every company could probably employ a sophisticated team of data scientists. So like, how can you make this, break down this problem in a more uh, easy to plug and play uh, method? And so a reinforcement learning as a service, um, I think has, big potential to be applied in enterprise applications of the sort. AlphaGo Zero, I think this is one of the, the cool results from last year I was really interested in. Uh, I think the, the, in the case of games, it's a little bit easier than just reinforcement learning out in the real world, but it's nonetheless the, the um, trajectory to get it to one uh, model that takes care of both poly policy and value. Um, and the fact that it extends well to other games is, you know, incredibly commendable. Um, so, a very good example of the end-to-end model. In terms of verticals, that's interesting. Farming. I've been looking at more traditional uh, verticals. Uh, in case of farming, the, even though the actual, I don't think anybody's employing an end-to-end -end model right now. But the proof of work is huge because the signals, again, are kind of clear as long as you create the infrastructure for it, right? So um, in the case of plants, you want to optimize maybe the time that it takes to grow and also the quality of the plant. Nutrition, um, pictures of whether the coloring is correct, etc. And then while it's growing, you have the inputs that you can control in, in terms of, uh, especially if it's indoor farming, which is very interesting, you have a lot of control over the climate, nutrition, um, various aspects. So as a result, you can imagine um, kind of infrastructure you can create to make this an end-to-end -end problem. And I guess more broadly, just deep reinforcement learning applied to robotics, which kind of intersects with the farming automation aspect. But uh, you know, in this case, uh, it's a paper by Chelsea, uh, Sidney, and 
have the real computer, and they showed that that Pentium model actually created a couple more informative representations than how you generally train a visual system first and then do the reinforcement learning. Okay, so lastly, this is more of a fun kind of area to focus on for why differentiable programming is useful, but it has an incredible potential as a generative method. So I guess what I mean by that is um, the ability to learn good approximations um, to data distribution gives, gives it an edge in creating artificially generated examples that have in, in very complex distributions that have high fidelity. So um, I think the most exciting thing about this is depending on how you design this pipeline and how you can have humans interact in it, it can create a very, uh, as a potential to be a very useful collaborative tool. So what do I mean by that? This is a paper, I don't remember when exactly came up, but it's out of um, some authors at the University of Toronto and MIT. And basically the, the problem setup is the following. I mean, we have a lot of um, image data. It's like ImageNet and, and, and CIFAR, the various CIFARs. And the, the labels are quite simple in some sense. It doesn't really capture a lot of ways that we interact with image data or scene data. It's, it doesn't capture a lot of like narrative um, uh, nuance that we might be interested in. So like, the authors here thought, hey, actually a very interesting instance where we can have this kind of underlying narrative data is where you have books that were made into movies. So in that sense, you have an in a connection between scenes that were played out um, uh, where you also know the script. And then in most instances, you also have then a glimpse into kind of the inner, the more introspective aspect of the picture. So what's interesting is when they just trained uh, this uh, neural network to not only match books to their, or particular aspects of the book to the scene, but then as a result train a kind of embedding where they could search for uh, the closest scene that would match some arbitrary text and vice versa. So you can start with the scene and then generate text that would be interesting to learn. So hopefully the audio works and I can uh, play this. Harry, please relax, or Madame Pomfrey will have me thrown out. Harry swallowed and looked around him. He realized he must be in the hospital wing. He was lying in bed with white linen sheets, and next to him was a table piled high with what looked like half the candy shop. Tokens from your friends and admirers, said Dumbledore, beaming. What happened down in the dungeons between you and Professor Quirrell is a complete secret, so, naturally, the whole... Okay. Um, so we recognize that one. In the next instance, they took a body, uh, they took an expert, excerpt from a romantic novel and then just matched it to the closest um, video that wasn't that novel. Here's what we get. I believe you will enjoy your time here. I am not a harsh master, but I am strict. When we are with others, I expect you to present yourself properly. What we do here in your room and in the dungeon is between you and I. It is a testament to the trust and respect we have for each other. So clearly not the right dubbing, but pretty gets the point. Um, so anyways, yeah, I thought it was the bottom video. The narrative seems somewhat appropriate. It's a little too much. It's a little easier than the sound of the late afternoon. The bartender in red waist and open bow tie is busy wiping down the center, replacing pants and putting up new posters. So, yeah, interesting data set. Okay. So, also in the area of uh, web design, uh, this is such a natural application, right? Like you have front end, uh, like what your web page looks like, and then there's a direct labeling with the code that generates it. So as something that you can pipe in through a CNN and plug into an RNN, uh, it was a very natural example of that. And so uh, in this case, uh, I guess both Aaron and uh, the fix to promote code uh, shows an example of how to, how to implement such an L network. Um, in the area of drawing, I really like this example because it shows not only, like, sure, we can generate 
good pictures, but what else? Like, how can we make this into an interesting tool that will be used? How can you think about it in terms of a business? Well, in this case, not only are you generating pictures, but you have levers in terms of controlling what the picture will look like. So they had fixed conditions on needing it to have silver hair, uh, long hair, a lush smile, and a good mouth and blue eyes, and if you like, generate pictures under the business space. So this just came out of you know a paper in the in the creativity workshop in NIPS, and I just think like you know sometimes it's not like the hard uh, the hard problem or the hard technical problem to be solved, but thinking about it is how will this tool be used that can uh, that can lead to interesting ideas uh, for the business. Okay, and lastly, this is kind of my favorite uh, thing that came out of the same workshop. Uh, but basically, you know, generating, um, using sequence to sequence models for music, very natural, right? You have these uh, symbols, in, in particular, like sheet music, they can pipe in and pipe out. Um, and music is highly structured, so it's like a very natural thing to apply to. But um, as I think mean, we all have an instinct for, music is not just the Position aspect, especially for the classical repertoire, the ability for a musician to render something well, like that is kind of an art form in itself, um, if, if not in that case, the uh, more important one. And so uh, the authors in this case took in um, really high quality media files and performances and trained on that uh, to generate very good um, music. So I just wanted to do a fun, okay, these uh, two examples I'll show you, and you can guess which one is done by the human and which one is done by uh, the human. So one is the neural network? A okay. and B. Right. So it's like pretty 50-50 split. I didn't cheat. I actually one it's done by a human. Uh, so B is the one done by a human. I didn't want to pick any any actual classical piece that people could recognize. So somewhat of a maybe fair or unfair comparison. So this is an improvised piece by human. And then uh, A was actually the real uh, piece. And I have actually some other examples. Yeah, I don't know, it seems very organic. There's attention to leg and uh, how softly or quietly or loudly you're playing. And some broader structure. The clips, however, that were generated, probably because of how much compute power you need, are less than a minute. And so the kind of responses to the paper were basically like, this is awesome, I want to hear like longer pieces. Can you can you carry on structure in a, in a long way? It's just like you know, narrative. So yeah, okay, so I gave you all these cool examples. So what is still hard now if you're thinking in terms of different people programming? Um, well, of course, lots of things. I mean, you're probably not employing with that as an example is these representations are powerful, but they're brittle. And so um, we need to better understand weaknesses. Um, so you know, thinking about patches, uh, actually one of my favorite still adversarial examples is the paper about Ian Goodfellow and Christian Zagady and a bunch of people several years ago because it just shows such a funny, I mean, it's a robust way to generate an adversarial example, but it just shows such a funny, like, you have a panda and then you're like 100% sure, or 99% sure that it's a given. Um, causality is an interesting uh, case. I mean, I think most of these models doesn't really express, uh, doesn't really have an ontology to express that, and I won't go into details here, but you can maybe check out some of Judeo Pearl's uh, writings on that. And then lastly, some of the interest actually coming from an investor is the infrastructure point of view, right? These, um, the paradigm, kind of, the differential programming paradigm exposes a lot of uh, potential for applications, but in order to enable it, you have to, um, I mean, you have to consider like, what does it mean to build up the infrastructure and do the extraction and cleaning and shaping? And those things take predominantly most of your uh, code base. Uh, so, um, 
to make it efficient and feasible for application. That's the stuff that I'm looking for to be built. And then lastly, in the related point, is also the compute uh, availability of that. I mean, one of the interesting things from a research perspective is, hey, our compute resources are never even, not even on the same order of magnitude as the brain. So in order to get there, the kind of power resources are required. It's, you know, very, 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 it's like so dissimilar. Our brain operates on, I think, 10 watts. So, so do we need to go to a different substrate? Have we pushed it to the limits? Maybe optical computing? Anyways, these are kind of more of the far out questions I look for as a And then, yeah, just in summary, like you have these three principles uh, to understand differentiable programming, where it shines in instances of their applications. But to finish off, I wanted to go back to this weird, strangely named object, the Gombach. See, uh, where, you know, our ability to iterate with compute um, was essential to arrive at the shape, right? But actually, we can find Gombach uh, in nature. Uh, the tortoise shell evolved to the shape, and uh, more, I guess, uh, I guess my point is, is that nature gets to explore these complex spaces because it can run in parallel uh, experiments in reality. It, um, survival is its feedback. So this is obviously known as the evolutionary process. Um, so I just wanted to use this as an inspiration then to like look forward uh, to the framework of differentiable